The Woman Worker by Nadezda Konstantinovna Krupskaya. Uh, this is a foreword. N.K. Kripskaya and the Woman Worker. Nadezda Konstantinovna Kripskaya, who lived 1869 to 1939, has been overshadowed as a revolutionary and essayist in the popular perception by the figure of Lenin and unfortunately became known by many simply as Lenin's wife. Despite her outstanding record as an educationalist, Kripskaya's writing remains neglected in English. She served from the first days of the revolution, firstly from November 1917, as deputy to Anatoly Lunikarsky, People's Commissar of Education and Enlightenment, where she took responsibility for adult education and developed the Soviet library classification system. The main Department of Political Education work decreed on November 3, 1920, that all libraries would form a joint library network and on January 21st, 1921 made the decimal classification of the International Bibliographic Institute obligatory. From 1920, she became chair of the Education Committee and was Deputy Minister of Education of the USSR from 1929 until her death in 1939. She also played a leading role in founding the communist youth movements, Komsom Komsomol and the Pioneers. The woman worker, Krupskaya's first pamphlet, was written in Siberian exile where she had joined Lenin following their arrest in 1896 and sentencing to three years internal exile in Shushensko or Shushenskoy. Krupskaya and Lenin married in July 1898. Krupskaya wrote The Woman Worker in 1899 under the pseudonym Sablina, one of several she used before the Bolshevik Revolution. Other pseudonyms she employed included Lenina, Artemanova, Wangina, Riba, Ribkina, Katya, Frey, and Galilei. Following his release from Siberia, Lenin left for Munich, where Krupskaya joined him in 1901. They arrived in London in April 1902. Kripskaya recalled in Reminiscences of Lenin in 1933, The immensity of London staggered us. Although the weather was filthy the day we arrived, Vladimir Ilyich brightened up at once and began to look around at, at this citadel of capitalism with curiosity. Plekhanov and the editorial conflicts for the moment forgotten. The Iskra group gathered around Lenin and Krupskaya found an editorial, editorial office with the Social Democratic Federation's 20th Century Press at 37 Clerkenwell Green. Today, visitors to Mark's house can today visitors to Mark's house can still see the office where Lenin edited Iskra, the newspaper of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. Krupskaya recalled. We were in the habit of going for rambles in the suburbs, too. More often than not, we went to Primrose Hill. It was the cheapest trip, the fare only costing six pence. The, ha- the hill commanded a view of almost the whole of London, a vast smoke wreathed wilderness of houses. From here, we took long walks into the parks and country lanes. Another reason we liked going to Primrose Hill was because it was near the cemetery where Karl, Mar- Karl Marx was buried. We used to go there. The Woman Worker was originally published and circulated in 1901 before being banned following suppression of the 1905 revolution. It was republished in 1925 with a new preface by the author, which is included in this translation. Its significance stems from being the first Marxist work on the situation of women in Russia. The author analyzes in some depth the causes of women's lack of rights under Tsarism. She calls on women to join the ranks of fighters for a better life, as equals and alongside men workers. The woman worker is a member of the working class, she writes, and all her interests are closely tied to the interests of that class. Krupskaya vividly describes the plight of peasant women in the family, their powerlessness and wholesale dependence on the husband. 
The woman is brought into the house, she writes. That is why the person of the woman is rated so low, and why, according to peasant custom, the woman is seen as property, which is valued in the main only for her capacity for work. The woman worker continued to be published in Soviet times, in the first volume of Krupskaya's complete works, published in 1957 by the Academy of Pedagogical Sciences of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, and republished in 1964. The work has recently been included in Krupskaya Nadesta Konstantinovna autobiographical articles, pre-revolutionary works, um, 1899 to 1917, Moscow, 2014, blah, blah, blah. In other words, the woman worker, though never lost, was neglected and has not been published separately since 1925, but solely as part of anthologies of Krupskaya's writing. While short extracts have been translated in English in the context of debates on prostitution, for example, the whole pamphlet has never b before been translated into English, in common with many other works by Russian revolutionaries. A 1901 first edition of The Women, Woman Worker, signed by the author with her pseudonym N. Sublina, went for sale recently at auction for 6,000 rubles, which is um, 80 pounds. Um... Introduction. This booklet was written a long time ago in 1889 in the Siberian village of Shushinskoy uh, Minuzinsk region, Yenisei province, where I was exiled together with Vladimir, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. As it was my first booklet, I left very nervous about whether I could manage it, or I felt very nervous about whether I could manage it. Vladimir Ilyich encouraged me. At that time, the book booklet could not be published openly as one would be arrested for it. It could only be published in secret, illegally. In 1900, together with Plekhanov, Axelrod, Zasilich, Martov, and Potrasov, Vladimir Ilyich went abroad to edit Iskra as a national newspaper for illegal disruption or distribution <laughs> inside Russia. I remained exiled in the town of Ufa. Vladimir Ilyich showed the manuscript of the woman worker to Vera Ivanovna Zasilich, an old revolutionary whom I liked very much and whose judgment I respected. Vera Ivanovna's comment was, the booklet contains some inaccuracies, but she takes the bull by the horns, and she recommended publication. Iskra printed the brochure and it was reprinted in an underground press inside Russia. It was only in 1905 that it could be openly printed and distributed. It was signed Sablina, a pseudonym which was sometimes used for me. It was then banned again. 25 years have passed since 1900, and there have been many upheavals in the meantime. They were the February and October revolutions. The working class has come to power. The conditions of the working class have changed, and in many ways, so Soviet law protects the right or no, so, oh, fuck. The working class has, ha has come to power. The conditions of the working class have changed, and in many ways, so have the conditions for the woman worker and woman peasant. Laws have changed. Soviet law protects the rights of the woman worker and peasant woman. Vladimir Lenin has written with passion and wonderfully well on the conditions of the laboring woman, on her rights, and on the need to draw her into the running of the state. A lot that, it, that is good has also been spoken of by other comrades. The women's sections of the Communist Party have greatly extended their activity, and with each passing day, women workers and peasant women are becoming more politically conscious, self-confident, and partaking ever more in the building of a new life. The lines of the woman worker have paled with age and gone into the past. Nonetheless, rereading the brochure, I thought, that I should agree to the proposal from comrades to a reprint of this old booklet. When one compares the description of the then conditions of the worker woman with today, one sees how far we have moved forward. But one also sees the other side, that such remains not yet done, and how doggedly one must work further to achieve the full emancipation of the woman worker. Take a look back over your own life. 
at the life of the women workers you know, and you will say in the words of Nekrasov, Oh, but a woman's lot is hard. Scarcely can one find a tougher lot than the woman's. Whether in the village or in the town, the working class woman remains an eternal perpetual worker. To her falls not less, if not more, work than to the man. She shares the same poverty, undernourishment, and loss of sleep, but finds more grief and humiliation. Nekrasov has a poem to whom in Russia is it a given to live well. In it, a pe- uh, in it, a peasant woman, when telling of her bitter life, said a woman once told her that a pilgrim disclosed the keys to happiness for a woman, for the joyful happiness of freedom were forgotten and lost by God himself. Lost, just think of it, a fish swallowed them. As to what fish it was that swallowed those precious keys and in what seas it wanders, God has forgotten. The peasant serf woman could only complain and live in hope that perhaps God will remember where those keys are hidden. The factory woman worker gave up hope for that and now begins, as yet only by groping almost subconsciously, to search for those keys herself. As to where the woman should look for those keys, the keys to happiness, for the joyful happiness of freedom, that is exactly what this booklet is about. We will examine the conditions of the woman worker, the peasant woman engaged in homeworking cottage industry, or in factory or workshop. We shall see that the conditions of a woman worker are particularly difficult because she is a member of the working class, that her conditions are closely tied in with the conditions of the whole working class, and that only the victory of the working class of the proletariat can liberate women. Furthermore, we shall examine the state of dependency in which the woman worker is subjected within the family, the subjugation of women to men. We shall point to the reasons for that dependence and show that she can only gain a position of total independence simultaneously with the victory of the proletariat. Finally, we will demonstrate that as a mother, the woman worker has an interest in that, vi- in that victory. Only when struggling arm in arm for the worker's cause can women find the keys to the joyful happiness of freedom. One, woman as a member of the working class. Let us examine the conditions. Let us examine the conditions of the woman worker, starting with the peasant woman. She has to tackle all kinds of heavy field work, with no let up day and night at harvest time, as in many places. Women plow and harvest alongside men. In addition to that, they shoulder the burden of looking after the poultry and cattle, household chores making clothes and looking after the children. In fact, it is impossible to list all the jobs that fall to the peasant woman. Life is particularly tough for the woman in a poor family. In addition to heavy labor, there is unrelenting misery, worries, humiliation, and grief. Meanwhile, the ruination of villages has advanced over recent years. Few households are relatively better off, and the majority are impoverished in one way or another. Even those that were middling are becoming poor. People are growing shorter, weaker, aging earlier year by year, and the number of households that are without a single horse or with only one is on the increase. Today in Russia, there are around 3 million horseshoe household or horseless households and the same number of one horse ones out of a total of 10 million households. What kind of a household is one without a horse or even with only one. How can one work the land properly without a horse? Badly worked and badly fertilized land provides a very poor return. An overplowed and exhausted plot cannot feed a peasant and his family. The peasant has to get bread to feed the family and money to pay taxes while necessity pursues him. So the peasant becomes an insolvent debtor to the kulak. He is forced to sign forward contracts for his labor which commit him to working off his debt. Tied hand and foot, he becomes a sort of hired laborer for the person who loaned him grain or money. In reality, he remains a proprietor in name only as he becomes a hired laborer for others in order to feed himself and his family on his own. And he lives no better than a hired laborer, eating only bread and half-starved at that. Constant undernourishment drains his strength and nearly always leads to the breakup of the family as its members scatter looking for paid work. In some provinces, 
Almost annually, part of the families of the poor peasants disperse for work. Often the family sits in semi-darkness in unheated cottages. There are no reserves, but by f- are, there are no reserves put by for a rainy day, and people exist only from day to day, so that every little crop failure brings hunger and disaster. Over the past one hundred years, the Russian people have suffered fifty-one famines, i.e., a failed harvest occurs not less than every two years. Hunger becomes a normal feature of life. The hunger of recent decades are illustrated by the horrors of complete ruination, scurvy, sicknesses from hunger, and consequential deaths that they bring to the poor peasant. Millions of people starve, and the life of the peasant woman in such poverty-stricken families defies description. She, just as her husband does, battles with dust, mud, and cold over a tiny piece of tilled land, commits herself to, to work for a nearby landlord or to his fellow, a well-to-do peasant, struggles to win an additional penny to pay taxes and arrears, goes hungry, falls ill from hunger, has to attend to her children, and works indefatigably, as does her husband. The woman welcomes almost any earnings on the side as a day laborer and goes on foot to other provinces in search of work. Leaving those provinces where land parcels are small and from those with poor soil, each spring tens of thousands of workers, including almost a half who are single young women and juveniles move southwards to the regions of the Don Army, Tavria, and Yekaterinoslav, which are regions of southern Russia and Ukraine and Crimea, and the Caucasus. They go on foot, subsist virtually on what they can beg, wandering from town to town until they find work. Those who hire them do not willingly give anything away and take full advantage of the helplessness of those seeking employment, among whom it is toughest for the young women. There are are rare newspaper notices of court hearings which illustrate the full horrors of the situations in which these young women find themselves when looking for work. In most provinces, The villages engage not only in arable farming, but also in what is called cottage industry. They do manual work at home, and the produce is for the greater part sold to a buyer middleman. The cottage industries are various, weaving, hat making, knitting, tanning, pottery, making lamps, nails, cutlery, samovars, cartwheels, spoons and icons, locks, and much besides. It is usual for the whole family of a craftsman to be involved in a given industry including the women and children. The children start work from the age of five or eight. There are also specifically female industries such as lace making and cloth fringe sewing. Women often often carry out very heavy operations such as treading clay, beating wool, nail making, and in the smithies, sometimes as hammerers, and so on. Cottage industry earnings are paltry. Thus, Kimri cobblers earn four or five rubles a month, and provide their own food. Weavers in the Medan region of the Kaluga province and Moscow province, lace makers, 10 kopecks a day, and so on. Work lasts 16 to 19 hours per day. To gain something of a picture of cottage industry, let us take as an example the production of mats and of most peasant footwear from bark fiber, bast, which is widespread in the Kaluga, Vyatki, Kostroma, Nisnagorod and other provinces. Work lasts up to 18 hours a day and involves the whole family. Children begin picking bast aged five and from eight years of age work the same as adults. The winter season lasts six months during which a fit group of four earns 20 to 25 rubles. By springtime, the bast workers are so weak that they stagger around like drunks. The sad and degraded condition of the home-working locksmith from Pavlov village, rushing about from buyer to money lender and back again, best characterizes the Pavlov village custom of pawning wives. Even working flat out, a whole family cannot earn enough to last one Monday market day to the next and has to spend all week finding additional income. Thus, each week they have to pawn what they have made. On market day, the cottage worker takes a sample of his goods to a buyer, and when a price is agreed, 
then commits himself to deliver the goods by a certain hour. But the goods have meanwhile been in pawn to the money lender, and the peasant does not have the wherewithal to settle with him. So the cottage worker brings his wife to the shop, takes the goods that he has promised to deliver to the buyer's store, and leaves his wife as surety till he can collect her after he receives payment for the goods. In that kind of way are the worker and his wife forced to maneuver backwards and forwards. With each passing year, an ever-increasing poverty drives the peasant cottage worker to the town. Work in his own business at home alternates with work in a factory. This same want also drives the peasant woman to town. Women's labor is used very widely in many mills, especially for cotton spinning and wool and silk processing. In cotton mills, there are even more women than men. On the other hand, in some industries such as, for example, steel foundries, there is no women's labor at all other than occasionally. The total number of women employed in mills and factories in 1890 in European Russia was about a quarter of a million, and since then the number has increased considerably. Where women's labor has become common as, for example, in cotton and cotton fabric mills, women's wages, although lower than men's, are not significantly so. One researcher has calculated that it makes up around four-fifths of men's wages in those industries. Where women are on piecework alongside men, they produce no less than them. One must note, however, that in those industries, men are paid a relatively low wage and it is hardly enough to live on. Where women are found only occasionally, the women's pay is so low that one cannot survive on it, so the women's wage only serves as a supplement to the family income, and if the woman happens to live alone, then poverty forces her to sell not only her labor power but also herself. Prostitution provides the necessary additional income. When she works in a factory, the woman has the same hours as a man. According to a law of June 2nd, it is 11 and a half hours. The law does not specify a limit on the length of the working day for women. According to our factory legislation, there is only one decree concerning women's labor, and that prohibits night work in the textile industry. But if the woman works on the same premises as the head of the family, i.e. father or husband, then she is permitted to work nights. The often labor in stuffy, dusty, overheated, or damp buildings at exhausting and monotonous work. The extremely unhealthy work harms the women's health to no less a degree than her poor food and housing. Coarse and tough food, which can be more easily endured when one is engaged in a physical work in the open, is harmful to the weakened organism of the factory worker. At the same time, women generally eat even worse than the men. They set up either their own women's food preparation cooperative, where the food is worse than the men have, and if they enter men's cooperative groups, they spend less but give up meat. A woman's wage is lower than a man's, and she is forced to cut down on food. Living accommodation in factory districts is bad, dirty, and exceedingly dear. So many people are stuffed in at night that the owners of quarters often do not know how many people are living in them. The stench is choking. For instance, in St. Petersburg, living quarters in factory areas are dearer than on Nevsky Avenue. The overnight rent for two in a bed runs from one ruble, 25 kopecks, to four rubles a month. It is no better in the factory dormitories. It will come as no surprise that living in such conditions, the woman factory worker suffers from all kinds of diseases. Women suffer more than men from the harmful factory conditions and factory doctors note that women workers are sick both more often and more seriously than men. In addition to work at the mill, women workers take on working in town as, seam as seamstresses, milliners, florists, and corset makers. But to secure earnings from such handicrafts, one has to have been apprenticed for some years, and that has to be paid for and is therefore beyond the reach of many. Moreover, even with an apprenticeship brings in little. The best thing is to find work in big workshops that supply the shops. But the wages there are extraordinarily low. The hours of work are no shorter than in the mill. There is a law of 1785 which lays down the apprentices start at 6 in the morning and work on to 6 at night with one and a half hours for dinner and half an hour for breakfast making up a total of 10 hours work. But that law is only on paper and is, and is observed nowhere. There's no supervision of apprenticeship training schools and the majority of apprentices have never heard of such a law. 
Only in the western part of the country, where apprentices are more united and act together, have there been some cases where the owners have been forced by strikes to keep to the law on the 10-hour day. Usually, however, work in the apprenticeship schools during the peak season runs virtually through the night. The skilled craftswomen work not for the 11 and a half hours that is the rule in the mills, but as long as their strength holds out, catching sleep on the benches or bare floor. The peak seasons are followed by lay- layoffs, which the skilled women workers, like it or not, have to enjoy without a penny in their pockets. So the position of the woman worker everywhere across the country is extremely harsh, as she suffers the same as the working man. Like him, she works without respite, suffers poverty, and, just as he does, she belongs to the class in society that is most deprived of and oppressed. The woman worker is a member of the working class, and all her interests are closely tied to the interests of that class. When the working class wins a better lot, then the position of the worker woman will change. If it remains in beggarly ignorance and without rights, then the worker woman will continue to drag out the same miserable existence she has today. Therefore, the woman worker cannot be indifferent to whether the working class wins a better fate. The worker's cause is her own dear and vital cause. It is as close to her as it is to the man worker. So what does this worker's cause consist of? Workers are dissatisfied with their conditions as they see that all wealth is created by their hands, their labor, and yet for this labor they receive just enough to feed themselves and to keep up their capacity for working. They work not for themselves, but for the owners of the mills, land, mines, shops, and the rest, or, as is customary to call those classes of the population, the bourgeoisie. All laws are drawn up to serve the property classes, and the whole country is run in the interests of the bourgeoisie. Workers have no part in drawing up laws, nor in the management of the country. Their job is to work, to work for others in defeat indefatigably fuck I hate that word to pay taxes and duties be silent and submissively bear cold and hunger and suffer denigration of their personal dignity the workers want to change this order of things they want no more classes no rich and poor for the land mills and factories workshops and mines to belong not to private individuals but to the whole of society and all managed by it at present the owners think only about how to enrich themselves They do not think about the health, comfort, and prosperity of the workers who work for them. They count as not the life of the working human being. Profit is their main aim. When the control of production passes out of the hands of private owners into the hands of society, then things will change. Society will concern itself with making it possible for everyone to live well, with seeing to it that every person has what is necessary, with sufficient free time to enjoy a full life to enjoy every happiness and pleasure that there is. Workers know that there need be no fear that there would not be enough goods to go round. Since the introduction of machines, which have so increased the productivity of human labor and new ways of cultivating the soil that have increased its fertility, there is no reason to be afraid of that. There will be enough for everyone. Under existing conditions, people live in poverty, not in any way because there is not enough grain, clothing, etc., Grain lies loaded on the railways and rots waiting for buyers, while alongside it the laboring masses swell up with hunger and die. The the factory owners warehouses burst with unsold goods, while by their gates crowds in rags search for work. When production is managed by society, everyone will have to work, but labor will not be as arduous as it is today as everything will be done to lighten the unpleasant aspects of working and it will not be in stuffy, stinking, and infected factories, but in well-lit, spacious, dry, and well-ventilated buildings. Labor will not be as lengthy as it is nowadays because all work, all will work, and unlike today, one will not see some workers, including children and pregnant women, straining over their workload while others are forced to be idle, jobless, and looking hopelessly for work. Everyone will have to work, but it will not be the forced, exhausting, and degrading work to which the working class is currently condemned. Society will take on itself the care for the weak, the sick, and the old. The future will hold no fears. The fear of dying somewhere in a backyard or living as a beggar, dependent on others. 
People will not be afraid if they, fa- if they fall ill that the family will be left destitute. A society as a whole will be responsible for bringing up the children, caring for them, and making them strong, healthy, and intelligent. Useful and knowledgeable people turned out as good citizens. Those who want such a state of affairs and who fight to achieve it are called socialists. It is especially among workers that there are many socialists. In Germany, Belgium, France, and some other countries, there are millions of socialists, and they are organized in in workers' parties, which act in unison and defend their common interests together, and they have made great advances. With every passing day, the number of socialists is on the increase. Workers can expect no improvement in their conditions from anyone else. Neither the Tsar nor God will help them. The Tsar looks upon everything through the eyes of the capitalists and the nobility, showering favors on them and granting them all sorts of rights. He hands over the administration of the country to them and counts workers who stand up for the rights as rioters, while he ceremoniously expresses gratitude to the troops for shooting down unarmed workers on strike. Thus it was in 1895, on the occasion of unrest at the Korzynkin textile mill in Yaroslavl, It is true that he states that he holds equally close to his heart the well-being of both factory owners and workers, but one would be blind not to see that those are just empty words. God does not go to the help of the poor. His servants only preach to the oppressed of the virtues of patience and humility to love their oppressors, and of the sin of cupidity to those who can hardly feed themselves, of the sin of idleness to people who labor 16 to 18 hours a day, and they speak of the kingdom of heaven of heaven while doing their best to distract all thoughts that workers might have of bringing about a better life on earth. It is a sin to think about this earth and complain, and sins are punished by the merciful God. No workers cannot expect anything from God or the Tsar. It is also a waste of time to expect the capitalists to change their minds and stop exploiting them, just as it would be to wait for wolves to stop eating sheep or for birds to give up catching insects. Capitalists live by exploiting labor power and will never give up exploiting. The workers of all lands know that they can rely on none but themselves, that they themselves must win a better fate on earth, that each on his own is completely powerless and defenseless. But once united all together in a huge army, they are a power which no state can withstand, a power that will come into its own. The more the workers act in concert, the more forcefully they fight for their rights, the clearer they come to appreciate the line of march and recognize their objective, the greater the power they will represent. It is not by chance that the words proletarians of all lands unite and one for all and all for one are repeated at workers' gatherings. The workers have to carry out a long and determined struggle. Every step forward has to be fought for. At first, workers fight for demands that are closest to them, for pay raises, a shorter working day, the removal of all manner of abuses that forbid them to strike, hold gatherings to discuss their affairs and to form unions. They are not allowed to write to newspapers about their needs and demands. In all confrontations between bosses and workers, the government takes the side of the bosses. Workers realize that for them to have proper organization to struggle with the factory owners, they need the freedom to strike, to hold meetings and to form unions to have freedom of speech and of the press. Yet they also see that top civil servants always take the side of the exalted and the rich and will always frame laws against the workers to keep workers in the dark and in ignorance. They impose every fresh taxes and deductions. All this will continue until the workers, through their elected representatives, have their say in drafting the laws and in running society. The workers therefore demand that the country be ruled according to laws that are passed by a parliament, an assembly of people's representatives, that the officialdom that manages the country has to account to parliament for their actions, so that no taxes or other deductions can be levied on the people without the approval of parliament, and that parliament decides on the use of the monies collected from the people. Workers demand universal and equal suffrage which would allow them to send their own representatives to Parliament. In a word, workers demand political freedom. Without political freedom and without participation in the running of the country, the workers workers will never be able to attain their cherished goal of a socialist order of society. 
Therefore, workers of all countries strive for political freedom, and there are already parliaments in all European countries where workers have a certain say in the running of those countries. Albeit, in many countries that participation is still very weak, but only in Russia is there no participation. Only in Russia are workers and all other ordinary inhabitants completely removed from taking part in the formulation of laws and in the administration of the country. As everything is decided by the Tsarist officials who are answerable only to themselves, in those countries where there is a political freedom, workers are organized in parties and have already been able to achieve much, and workers' conditions are much better than in Russia. In Russia, the struggle for the workers' cause is only just beginning, and a workers' movement is embryonic, but in all corners of Russia, today the fires of struggle have been lit, and with each year that passes, the workers' movement will grow and strengthen. <coughs> so how should the woman worker relate to the struggle to win the workers' cause? Should she take part in it? It is often the case today that the woman adopts a very negative attitude to her husband's involvement in the workers' cause. She completely mis- misunderstands what he is getting involved in and only sees danger in it. Frequently, she knows nothing whatsoever about the workers' cause or the workers' movement and thus does not understand her husband, nor sympathize with him. She tries in every way to interfere with his studies and is hostile to his friends. Young, politically conscious workers often report that it is difficult to find a wife who is sympathetic to them in their activities, and that they do not want to marry someone who would drag them down. One also finds among politically conscious men workers, some who think that women should not get mixed up in the struggle for the workers' cause that it is none of their business, and that it would be much better if only the men carried on the struggle. That is a mistaken approach. It would be difficult for men to win through on their own. If women do not join the workers' movement, if they are hostile towards it, they will always be standing in its way. Let us say the men workers organize a strike and the employer is ready to concede, but women offer to take on the men's jobs. The strike is then lost. Who knows the extent of harm that women who are not organized, who do not participate in the workers' movement, can cause? Stopping women joining the struggle is the same as leaving half of the workers' army unorganized. Most politically conscious men workers understand that it is essential that in the struggle for the workers' cause, women go hand in hand with the men to increase the numbers in the ranks of the militant workers' army and to tighten the ranks of the workers to attain victory. And the women will not be left out. It is to the extent to which they begin to play a part in productive labor that they see more and more clearly that their interests are the same as those of the working man, to understand that their own liberation is closely linked to the liberation of the working class. They see that they have no choice but to struggle for the workers' cause. In the western part of the Russian Empire, the most politically conscious women workers are already affiliated affiliated to the movement. They help the men workers in their struggle and attentively follow what is said and written about the workers' movement. They take part in mass meetings, celebrate May Day, and become organized and found their own women's newspapers. The women's movement is growing year by year. In some parts of Russia, women are also beginning to take part in the struggle. As an example, we can mention the women's strike at the Lafremy Tobacco Factory in St. Petersburg in 1895. The Brest-Litovsk and Belostok wrappers and cigarette factories in 1897, and more recently the Katz cigarette wrappers factory in Kiev. The hosiery workers in Vilna and strikes in Riga and Superkov at the Konshin works and others. Besides those, women and men usually walk out simultaneously at cotton weaving and spinning mills. Two. <sighs> Two, the conditions of women workers in the family. Of course, women workers suffer not only because they go out to work, but also from being women, from being dependent on men. From the earliest age, the peasant girl works in her parents' family as a laborer. She is regard- regarded simply as the property of her parents who can make her work from morning to night, can send her out to work and take away all of her earnings. To see just how widely the view of the peasant girl is the property of her father can be shown by the following. For example, there have been a number of cases where a village community has forbidden a girl to marry until their father has paid off the arrears on his debts. In such a case, the person 
of the girl counts as nothing as she is simply seen as property that can be held for debts. A girl is often married off to a person that she doesn't even know. The ritual of lamentation that survives everywhere and is acted out at as the party for girls on the eve of the wedding points to how little happiness awaits her. When a bride is chosen, the main qualities sought are that she be healthy, works well, and is strong. <laughs> is strong? <laughs> Fucking cat. <sighs> when a bride is chosen, the main qualities sought are that she be healthy, work well, and is strong, agile, and hardy. The girl leaves her father's family for that of her husband. There, as before, she works without respite, and, as previously, she remains a dependent. It does happen, of course, that the man and woman get on well and come to love one another, but even then the woman is not protected against what is known as the husband's teaching. The peasant woman who has not experienced a beating from her husband is a rarity, and the woman, therefore, gets used to looking on beatings as a matter of course, unless the husband is particularly brutal." But even then, the woman is not allowed to leave her husband. He has the power not to allow her a passport of her own, and wherever she goes, he can have her brought back under guard. How can such a dependent state of woman be explained? The man as master gives all the orders about work, and the woman is only there to carry them out. The man decides everything, when to start plowing or sewing, whether to take on such and such work or not, and it is the man who gets the money to pay taxes, and selling grain and cattle is also his responsibility. Seeing to all the finer points about work is up to him. As it is the man who runs the household, it is he who takes part in discussion of all community affairs that are decided at gatherings about the land and taxation share, allocations, and so on. The woman ex- is excluded from all social affairs tied to matters of the house and children. The husband is the head of the family because the whole household rests on him. The husband is the head of the family also because all the property, land, cottage, cattle, and the rest belongs to him. The woman is brought into the house. That is why the person of the woman is rated so low and why, according to peasant custom, the woman is seen as property, which is valued in the main only for her capacity for work. In those cottage industries where the business is only a supplement to farming the woman's position, is little changed, and although she assists her husband, that does not make her more independent. But where farming retreats to the background and earnings from the cottage handicrafts become the main source of income, when the woman can earn enough to manage a life outside the family, then things change. The woman's voice takes on more importance in the family and divorce becomes easier. Where a woman, thanks to her playing a part in manufacture, attains independence, She can sometimes obtain a parcel of land, thus gaining the right to possess land fully on the same terms as a man. We see see that in those branches of industry where women's labor has become customary, the woman working in the factory is paid only a little less than the man and is able to feed herself. The husband ceases to be her breadwinner. She provides for herself and sometimes, when her husband is out of work, also keeps him. She works in the factory completely separately and independent of her husband instead of under his command in the way seen in peasant life. All this, that is, a woman's independent work with an independent income, cannot but affect the relations between husband and wife. The wife ceases to be the husband's slave and becomes an equal member of the family. Total dependence on her husband is replaced by equality, It becomes not so easy for the parents to give away in marriage a factory girl who, since her youth, can earn her keep. She can choose a bridegroom who suits her. Marriages in a factory environment are made more according to mutual agreement than for material calculations. In cases where a husband and wife do not get on, it is easier for them to separate than it was in peasant conditions. As, should they separate, they do not destroy a household business because each of them can live on their own earnings. Divorces are much more often among factory workers than among peasants. Furthermore, among them, free relations between men and women are the general rule. Men and women doing 
night work together and the conditions of factory accommodation contribute to making liaisons outside marriage easy, even too easy. How could it be otherwise? In factory dormitories, separation of the sexes in different rooms is not the rule and in the overwhelming majority of factories, complete mixing of the sexes and ages prevails. Children and grown-ups, men and women, single people and the married share the same bedrooms and bunks. How is one to work out accurately who is illegally married or not? Among workers, relations between a man and a woman out of wedlock are accorded the same common rights as according to those in a legal marriage. In such relations, the woman is freer than where she, than were she to be the husband's wife, as she is not a dependent on the man with whom she lives. He has no legal rights over her and cannot, for instance, refuse to allow her to have a passport or force her to live with him. In a word, an independent income frees women from the power of men. But if the woman earns too little to survive on, as women's pay is very low in all those branches of industry where their labor has not yet become customary, as also in some trades... She has to live with her parents or husband. And if she has neither the one nor the other, she is forced to seek additional income from prostitution. As recently as May 1899, 1899 in Riga, there was very huge workers' disturbances over this. They started with the fact that women at a jute mill had demanded an increase in rates of pay, and they set off as a group of the governor's office to complain about the factory administration. On the way, the women were halted and locked into the Alexandrov Park. As they were leaving work, men workers from the Phoenix factory and some others began freeing the women by force. The governor called out the army, and from the 5th to the 15th of May, Riga was turned into a battlefield as the soldiers fired on the workers and the workers responded by throwing stones at the military, smashed windows and set fires to buildings. But the greatest fury of the workers was directed against the brothels, and 11 of them were destroyed in one night. Why did the workers set upon the brothels? What had that got to do with the strike and the workers' disturbances? What had brothels got to do with those? It turns out that when the workers announced it was impossible for their wives to live on the earnings they received, the authorities cynically told them that they could find additional income from the brothels. In that way, prostitution was openly stated to be the only way in which a woman living only on her own earnings could supplement her miserable pay. Who then can blame a poverty-stricken woman for selling herself, for preferring the only readily available extra earnings to beggarly existence, hunger, and sometimes a hungry death? Bear in mind that there is nothing enjoyable about being a prostitute. One has only to listen to how the well-fed bourgeois and his wife talk with contempt of the depraved factory women and girls, and with what hypocritical disgust these ladies, who have never known poverty, pronounce the word prostitute. Bourgeois professors shamelessly go into print to assert the prostitutes are not slaves, but are people who have chosen to take that road. It is the same hypocrisy that insists that no one prevents a worker from leaving a given factory where it is impossible to breathe, what with the dust, poisonous vapors, heat, and so on. They voluntarily remain working there for 16 to 18 hours a day. But if a woman receives miserable pennies for her work and yet is not always forced to sell herself and still remains supported by a husband or her parents, she does not have the independence of a woman who needs no one else's support. She still has to subordinate herself to those who keep her as she is unable to do without their help. Thus we see that independent earnings free a woman worker as a woman and make her equal to a man. Only when she is engaged in large-scale industry can she be free. One must, however, note that first of all, there are still comparatively few women earnings or earning wages in factory and mill. As we saw... As we saw in 1890, there were only around a quarter of a million. 
Today, that figure is a certainly much greater, but nonetheless is probably not more than half a million. Secondly, in many branches of industry, women's labor is paid so badly that the woman worker cannot survive alone on that money. Also, even where the woman for the moment does receive a com- comparatively good wage, she must be prepared for the ev- eventuality of the introduction of machinery or hold up in production, putting her on the street without a crust. What then? Either she again has to be a burden for her husband or relatives, again becoming a dependent, or get by through prostitution. Only the complete victory of the workers striving to replace the current order by a socialist one can make women completely free. We have already said that under socialism, in a socialist system, all adult and healthy people will work, and it follows that that includes women, excluding, of course, those pregnant or nursing. But in return, all will share the benefits produced. All will be guaranteed the means of subsistence, and it follows that that will apply to women. Women's dependence on men today stems from men keeping women, whether wife, love, lover, or daughter. When that ceases, women will be free from men. Thus, we see that a woman has a double interest in the success of the worker's cause, as a worker and as a woman. The words proletarians of the world unite cannot but meet with a response in a woman's heart. She cannot but join the ranks of the fighters for a socialist system for a better future. 3. Three, women and the, and the upbringing of children. For the woman worker, family life means being tied into endlessly looking after children. There is no chance of her educating the child, but only of being able to feed it. With the birth of a child, the peasant woman faces added chores. After all, one cannot both go out to work and care for children. Work waits for no one, and the peasant woman goes out to work, leaving the children to be looked after by some old feeble woman or the older children. Anyone who has lived in a village knows that looking after them, what looking after them means. Before being weaned, a baby has a sour feeding horn stuffed into its mouth and is fed all sorts of greens together with chewed black bread, then rolled up in a sheepskin, rocked in a cot till it is unconscious, kept in a stuffy cottage, and at night is taken outside almost naked. The mother feeds it now and then. One keeps hearing that a six- to eight-year-old nurse dropped or bumped a baby, or burnt it, or did something else to it, whatever comes to mind in a six-year-old. But even if the mother herself is looking after the child, things are a little better. She has no idea whatsoever how a human organism is constructed, how a child develops, what it requires in order to grow strong, sturdy, and healthy. The peasant woman is mostly guided by custom and superstition. But even if she knew how to bring up a child then with the best will in the world, she could not do what is needed. A child needs cleanliness, warmth, and fresh air. But there are ten people living in a cottage, which is not heated, and sheepskins, calves, and the rest all around. Willy-nilly, she gives it up as a bad job. When the child is sick, the mother has no idea what to do, and there often is nowhere to go for treatment. Worst of all is where the sickness is infectious, as with smallpox, scarlet fever, etc. When the child needs to be isolated, how can it be done where the whole family lives in the cottage? So the children infect one another and die through lack of help. It is no wonder that in the villages, half the children die before they are five. Only the sturdiest survive. Let us now take a look at how matters stand with schooling for peasant children. Very often there is no school in the village, and learning to read and write is a matter of chance. But even when there is a village school, the peasants often cannot afford to place their children in it. The children are wanted at home to look after younger brothers and sisters, to tend the shop and help with all manner of household chores. At times, there are no clothes to wear for school, especially if it is somewhere in a neighboring village. Those children who do go to school more or less learn only to read, write, and count, and badly at that. Our schools in Russia are very bad, and teachers are forbidden to teach anything other than the basics. The government benefits from holding people in ignorance, and therefore it is forbidden in schools to describe 
or to give children books to read on how other peoples have won their freedom and what their laws and systems are like. It is forbidden to explain why some people have such and such rules while others have other ones, why some people are poor and others are rich. In a word, schools are forbidden to tell the truth and teachers must only teach the children to honor God and the Tsar. The people in charge take great care to it that a teacher does not let slip some truths and they select teachers from among those who have no understanding of anything. So the child leaves school knowing as little as it went in with. The mother herself is usually unable to teach it anything as she knows nothing herself. Here is how Leo Tolstoy speaks of the ignorance of the Russian peasant in the words of a soldier in his The Power of Darkness. And so what do you women folk know? You're just like the blind puppies sticking their your noses in manure. A man at least does a stretch in the army, rides a train and goes to town. But what have you ever seen? Apart from your foul women's tricks, you know nothing. The best she can hope for is to teach her son to observe fasts and church rituals, to fear God and its elders, respect the rich, and to teach it humility and patience. It is unlikely her children thereby become happier and freer or better to understand the meaning of the words all for one and one for all, and doubtful if they will be better at winning justice and take a stand for justice. What we have said about the peasant woman as an educator applies much the same to the woman as mother who works at a cottage industry. She knows as little as the peasant woman who is overwhelmed by work and just as powerless to educate her children. These are drawn into cottage handicrafts between the ages of five or eight, when they are given some simple operations to carry out, but work just as adults and often the same long hours. Such work is destructive of the child's organism, undermines health, and blunts the child's mental capacities. Without any moving about, without clean air in a stuffy cottage, the child grows sickly. Monotonous work from morning to night starves its intellect, does not develop it, and it becomes sluggish and stupid. There could be no schooling of any sort. Cottage workers can only feed themselves more or less when the whole family, the old and children, work without respite. What schooling can there be in these circumstances? The male woman is distinguished by her poor health. A woman's organism suffers more from the harmful conditions of factory work, and a weak or sick woman produces weak children. One piece of research has found when a woman in the match works marries, and women and children make up the greater part of the workforce in them, she becomes a hotbed for a sickly and half-alive generation similar to her own, made all the worse by a number of diseases which lead to an early grave. In our factory legislation, there are no laws that limit or make lighter the work for pregnant women. There is only in the rules governing the custody of and dispensation of monies collected in fines on factory workers stipulation that this money might be used, amongst other things, to pay allowances to women workers in the last stage of pregnancy and who give up work a fortnight before giving birth. So there is no obligatory payment of benefit but only wording that such a payment may be made, i.e. such contingency is left fully to the yea or nay of the factory owner. In fact, such payments are made almost nowhere. Without support and frightened to lose her job, the woman worker carries on almost up to the eve of giving birth, and she returns to work before fully recovering. That is why factory women so often miscarry, have premature births, and all kinds of women's ailments. Life with children is very difficult for the woman worker. Coming home tired from the factory, she has to get down to the washing, sewing, cleaning, feeding, and washing the child. Sometimes the mother is overjoyed if she has a neighbor who gives her the idea of feeding the child a drink made with poppy seeds. The child sleeps calmly and the mother is happy. She has no idea that with that drink she is poisoning her child, as there is a lot of opium in poppies, and opium is a frightening poison, and can later turn the child into a complete idiot. 
When she leaves for work during the day, the woman factory worker leaves the children in the care of an old woman neighbor, and when they have grown a little, they are left without anyone to supervise them. The children virtually grow up outdoors. The, they don't eat properly, get cold, go about in rags and dirty from early childhood, and see their fill of drunks, debauchery, fights, and much else. That is how the preschool children grow up. There are schools in the town, but town and suburban schools are usually overcrowded so that it is difficult to get into them, and factories and mills do not always have their own schools. The law allows factory owners to set up schools for workers' children, but does not oblige them to. So not all workers' children go to school. When children reach the age of, at which they are taken on at factories, according to our factory legislation, children start at 12, they begin to provide for themselves and soon become completely independent. In general, the factory woman worker has a lot of grief with her children, lots of worries, but rarely seeing them and the children grow up as half strangers to her. If we take into account how difficult it is for a factory woman worker with children, especially if the child is illegitimate and its upkeep falls entirely on its mother, then we will understand why the woman is often forced to hand her children over to a foundling hospital or to a woman who specializes in looking after children. Newspapers sometimes carry stories that in this or that big industrial town, an angel's work has been discovered. These are where a woman earns a living by being paid for, bringing up babes in arms and then through starvation by feeding them opium and in other ways sends them as soon as possible to the next world, turning them, as it were, into angels. After a court hearing, the maker of angels is sentenced to hard labor, but then somewhere else the same conditions give rise to another angel's works. A woman factory worker finds it impossible to feed a child. The same fate also awaits the child of a live-in maid servant. A servant is not supposed to have a family. All over the place, a condition of employment for servant women is that they are not to have, to have men visitors, and a married woman is taken on reluctantly if her husband visits her. A servant woman with children is never employed. So, by taking up her post, the servant has concluded a forward contract on her entire future. In this, her situation is worse than that of the woman factory worker as the latter works a set number of hours, and after these, she is her own mistress. A live-in servant can never dispose of herself, as all her time belongs to her masters. These usually do not allow her to have any time to spend with children, and therefore, like it or not, she has to surrender her child to a foundling hospital. Thus we see that in most cases the woman worker finds herself in a situation where it is totally impossible for her to bring up her own children properly. She is completely unprepared for the role of bringing up her children as she does not know what is harmful or good for a child and does not know how to educate it. Without learning, you can't even mend a shoe, as the German socialist Zetkin, Zetkin, the, <laughs> fuck, Zetkin wrote in her well-known brochure on the women's movement in Germany. Is one really to believe that in order to bring up a human being, one does not need to be properly prepared? But even if the woman worker were trained in the role of educator in her present conditions, it would be almost a waste of time. She would not have enough time nor the wherewithal by which to educate her children. The only things she can think of, think about is to see to it that her children are fed, clothed, and dressed. Clothed and dressed are the same thing. But often she is not in a position even to guarantee that her children's stomachs are filled and she is forced to leave them to the mercy of fate. Such is the state of affairs under the present social system. What will the bringing up and education of children look under a socialist system? We have already said that socialists stand for the social upbringing of children. The indignant bourgeois exclaims, those terrible socialists are out to destroy the family and take children away from their parents. That is, of course, absurd rubbish as such a thing is out of the question. No one in nowhere had it in mind to take children away from their parents. When one speaks of a social upbringing for children, one means, first of all, that the worries of supporting them will be removed from the parents, and that society will provide for the child not only the means of existence, but will concern itself with seeing to it that it has everything necessary for it to develop fully and in every way. The most difficult time for bringing up children is before they are old enough to go to school. 
In Western European countries, there are already what are called kindergartens. When a mother sets off to work, she takes her small children with her and leaves them in the kindergarten until she is finished. She can be relaxed at work because she knows that no misfortune will befall her toddlers as they are in the hands of numerous teachers and their loving care. Laughter and the sound of children's voices announce the presence of the kindergarten house and garden. At first glance, it can seem that there is no order there, but that is only how it appears. There are set programs for their activities. They are broken up into groups, and each group gets on with its business. They dig the earth, water, and weed rows of plants, clean vegetables in the kitchen, wash the dishes, plain wood, glue things together, sew, draw, sing, read, and play. Every game and other pursuit teaches something, and the main thing is that the child is trained to be tidy, to labor, learns not to fall out with its friends, and to give ground to others without caprices and tears. The teachers know how to keep three- and four-year-old toddlers occupied to eat and be put to bed on time. They spread wide mattresses on the floor and the children lie next to each other covered by a common blanket. How different is that way of passing one's time in the kindergarten from the aimless wandering from corner to corner to which children are doomed who have no one with the time to occupy them? Don't interrupt. Don't get in the way. Clear off is what the kids at home are told all the time. However, it must be said that there are as yet still very few good kindergartens even in Western Europe. We have given the description of a kindergarten only to show that educating children can start from an early age and that in a social kindergarten, children can pass their time with great advantage to themselves and much more happily than at home. If there are good kindergartens even today, then they will be much better in a socialist society. As children coming from all members of society will be looked after in such kindergartens, it will be in the interest of all to see to it that they be organized as best as possible. Children then pass from kindergarten to school. In a socialist society, schools, of course, will not be like they are today. In the schools of the future, pupils will acquire much more knowledge and will also get used to productive labor. The principal feature is that schools will not only teach but will develop their potential, spiritual and physical, so that they are brought up as useful and energetic citizens. The bourgeois who is not burdened with having to worry how to feed and bring up children, who can put several well-lit rooms at the disposal of his own children, can provide all manner of comforts, hire all kinds of wet nurses, maids, governesses, servants, and teachers, can look with indignation at the social provision of education. Women workers cannot fail to recognize all the benefits of social education. Maternal feelings make her wish for the social education of children, a socialist system, and victory for the workers' cause. 4. Conclusion We have observed that no matter how heavy factory worker work is for a woman worker, it has its bright side. An independent wage frees woman from the dominance of man as she becomes much more independent of him. Work in the factory has another bright side as it awakens woman's class consciousness. Let us explain what this means. When a, wo when a woman enters the factory, she sees that there is pressure on her to do as much work as possible for the smallest possible reward through cutting her rates of pay, fines, and being cheated. The overseer, manager, and other superiors shout at her all the time. Daily conflicts give rise to an awareness in the woman worker that her interests and those of the factory owner are completely opposed. He is interested in making her work as much as possible for the lowest possible pay. In addition to that, it is in the factory that the woman worker comes face to face with the employer's class and involuntarily compares her conditions with those of the boss. He holds in his grasp the whole works while she has nothing. The employer lives in luxury and she half starves. He gives orders to all the workers, abuses them and sacks them. The fate is in the hands while she lives with the expectation that at any minute she can be dumped on the street. She is aware of her complete helplessness, that she is defenseless against the owner. Every tiny conflict with the overseer or clerk brings up the bitterness of being an oppressed human being and that makes her indignant. And she is not alone in feeling thus. By her side are hundreds of other women and men workers in the same position as she is. 
Everything that affects her affects them also. What angers her angers them also. And what is more, she cannot remain indifferent to any offense or injustice meted out to any of her fellow workers. All of this deeply worries her and is clear to her. Little by little, she begins to realize that the women and men workers alongside her are not only fellow workers, but fellows in spirit, and that she shares common interests and common feelings with them. They are her comrades because they are workers. The meaning of the words all for one and one for all become ever clearer to the woman worker. When there are confrontations without management, she sees that her comrades are always ready to back her up. Or, fuck. When there are confrontations with management, she sees that her comrades are always ready to back her up and she is to support them. The same conflicts show her that while she is weak when alone, she ceases to be weak when she acts together with her comrades. She comes more and more to appreciate that unity is strength. Collisions with the police and all kinds of authority, exiling and persecution of workers, the ban on discussing their affairs, the formation of unions make... Fuck off... Collisions with the police and all kinds of authority, exiling and persecution of workers, the ban on discussing their affairs, the formation of unions make it clear that the government is on the side of the exalted and the rich. They teach her the necessity of political struggle and the necessity of winning for workers the right to take part in drawing up laws and in the way the country is run. Little by little, the woman comes to understand that political freedom is required for the working class to win a better fate and that without the organization of the working class, socialist system is impossible. So, gradually, class consciousness is born in the woman worker. Of course, this does not all happen in a trice, as years are sometimes needed for this, and not all women working in a factory are able to appreciate their conditions with the same degree of consciousness. But, nonetheless, working in a factory prepares women for the struggle for the workers' cause, just as it prepares men for the struggle. Austrian pastors, Belgian and Swiss Catholic priests, and many kind gentlemen busy themselves with trying to have laws that would ban women from working in factories. They blame factory work for taking women away from the family and argue that it is harmful to women's health. All this is so, but they forget one thing, that women are driven into factories by poverty and women who are thrown out of factories would have to seek other sources of income. They would turn to taking work home and getting caught up in cottage industries and be forced to strain themselves even more at such work. Another possibility is that they would have little option but to sell their very selves. Those kind gentlemen are sorry for the woman worker, but they fail to appreciate the position she is in. Neither do they understand the liberating effect of factory work on women. They believe that fighting for the worker's cause is evil and that it would be much better for a woman to stay at home and take no part in it. Women workers themselves see matters somewhat differently. They speak out against banning women from factory factory work. Women are usually paid less than men. Therefore, factory owners are very happy to have women's labor in their factories, and sometimes to replace men by women. That is why many men workers would like laws to keep women out of the factories. They see women as dangerous competitors who cut the price of labor as they offer their labor, below subsistence rates. But what what would happen if workers won such a ban? Would they be able to take the place of the displaced women? No. The factory owners would never agree to replace cheap women's labors with dearer men. We know from the history of factory legislation that when a law was introduced that limited the use of child labor, the employers did not place child labor with the dearer labor of grown-ups. They introduced new up-to-date machinery with the help of of which they could dispense with child labor. It would be the same if any law forbade women's labor. The employers would introduce new machines and the men would have won very little. No, in order to prevent women cutting wage rates, men must not demand... Fuck. No, in order to prevent women cutting wage rates, men must demand not laws to keep women out but to insist on equal pay for men and women. Then the factory owner would have no basis for preferring women's women's to men's labor. These days, the employer prefers women's labor to men's not only because women's labor is cheaper, but also because women are more compliant and compromising than men, 
and the employers can exploit them to their heart's content. Therefore, men must help the women workers to organize themselves, to awaken class consciousness in them, as conscious and organized women will be less receptive to the employer's demands and will not allow themselves to be twisted around the boss's little finger. But if the woman worker cannot agree to women's labor being forbidden, then she cannot but want factory laws that protect her life, health, and interests. Representatives of workers' unions from all countries held a meeting at an international congress in 1897 in Zurich, Switzerland. They discussed measures for the protection of health and safety in all countries, and regarding the protection of women's labor, they resolved to campaign everywhere for, one, all round and effective legal health and safety protection for all women factory and office workers in large-scale and small industries, in handicrafts, trading establishments, the post offices, telegraph and telephone agencies on the railways, in shipping and elsewhere, and to cover cottage industries as well. Effective protection is defined as not existing only on paper, but in actually being enforced. For that to be the case, there must be severe punishment for factory owners who fail to comply with the law, and the appointment of a well-staffed and independent factory inspectorate to ensure implement implementation of the law. 2. Congress resolved that, above all else, the working day for all women factory and other women workers should not exceed 8 hours and 44 hours a week. Work must end at midday on Saturdays so that women are guaranteed time off work until Monday, a break of at least 42 hours. 3. Entrepreneurs to be strictly forbidden to set women workers in factories and elsewhere extra work to take home after completing their shifts. 4. Around the time of giving birth, mothers may not be engaged in manufacture for a total of 8 weeks before and after giving birth. In all cases, 6 weeks minimum to be taken off after the birth. The law must list those branches of industry in which pregnant women are not to be engaged. During the pregnancy leave, women must receive compensation for loss of wages that is never to be less than her usual wage, to be paid out by the state or the commune. 5. There must be special health and protection laws to cover village women workers and maidservants which provide protection levels that are no worse than for other categories of employed women. 6. Congress demands that there be equal pay for women and men doing the same work. So how are the workers to secure implementation of the Congress demands? They will be publicly discussed in print and at meetings. The demands will be put into petitions to Parliament, petitions signed by many people, sometimes in their thousands. Workers' representatives will make demands in Parliament for the corresponding laws to be published and in that way secure implementation of the Congress demands. Here in Russia, one cannot openly discuss workers' conditions or present petitions, and we have no Parliament. It is laughable to expect the government to implement the Congress demands. Every law that favors workers has to be won in struggle, just as they were won in the struggles of 1885 and 1887. But even when won, their implementation is constantly being bypassed and not implemented. In order to win genuine labor protection, the workers must win political freedom, as their brothers, the European workers, have done. Political struggle is the one way for workers to achieve improvements in their conditions. In the struggle for better conditions at work, for, for political freedom and a better future, the woman worker will go arm in arm with the man worker.